What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. Well, we brought Robert Babal here from Spain. Thank you. And I'm going to let him tell you his story, but I've seen him on Ancient Aliens, and I know you've had a other, lot of other shows besides that. Yeah. Yep. So he's going to tell you his story and his background, too, so I don't have a big, long thing in the program. I don't like I to read I have plenty of time to tell my story. <laughs> it's you're there you're, you're stuck here anyway. for two hours, guys. <laughs> you're mine. We're all just doing our work. That's just something we have to put in there for our bio. Okay, but Robert's got a lot of... What, you're going to give two talks. What's the one going to be on tonight? Yeah, okay. My first talk uh, is going to be... I think it's titled The Star Religion of Ancient Egypt or the Pyramid Builders. Is that right? That's what you have? Uh, that's tonight. Uh, although I'll be starting with some odd stuff, uh, but you'll see what I'm getting at. Okay, and that's the first one tonight. That's the first one. And tomorrow, don't miss it, because it's uh, a book that's just been published uh, in, 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 uh, here in the States. Okay. So I'm going to let you yeah, go. Yeah, let, let me go. Let me go. Robert Babal. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I should start by thanking uh, Dolores and her uh, extended family or tribe. Sounds like a tribe, and she keeps introducing people to me, and they never stop. And this is here is another grandson, and another. Huh? I said she won the Grand Slam. You know, she's got daughters, grandchildren, great grandchildren. You know? I'm sort of one away. You keep beating me, Dolores. You know, with books and and grandchildren. Uh, thanks to the Ozark Mountain publishing company and transformation conference. It's my first, perhaps not my last. <laughs> or perhaps my last. No. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank specifically the, uh, the technical team. They've been really nice. Uh, Cherokee, a, a nice clap for Cherokee here. Yeah? <laughs> He's been very helpful and very tolerant. <laughs> I've got also weird stuff here. Um, well, let me introduce myself. You, you've read the pamphlet, but what I'd like to tell you is that <clears throat> as I'm speaking to you now, um, I'm kind of hopping from, from various languages. Uh, I was uh, born in Egypt, in the city of Alexandria, in 1948, in case you're interested. <laughs> I'm going to work it out, 66. And, uh, <clears throat> I come from a rather mixed, uh, mixed family, but this was quite common in, in Alexandria. Uh, it was four years before the first revolution. You've heard a lot about the Egyptian revolution these days, right? 
the 1952 revolution, where they got rid of the monarchy, famous King Farouk. I was uh, four years old when it happened. And in those days, there was what they called a foreign community, a cosmopolitan community. I'm, I belong to, the, well, it kind of disappeared, but I belong to this cosmopolitan community. And we had Greeks and Maltese, Italian, French, English. In fact, we weren't really foreigners. I, I have my, my connection with Egypt goes uh, all the way, I've discovered lately, to the time of Napoleon, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, right? Two families that had come from Aleppo, where there is all these problems in Syria now, in the city of Aleppo, and had settled in Egypt in 1785. They were Christians from Aleppo, Syrians, and uh, two families. Uh, one had a son, I don't know how many children they had, but there was a son called Joseph, and a, do and a daughter, the other family, called Teresa. And it's one of these weird stories. The, the, the son got recruited in Napoleon's army. And uh, when they evacuated Egypt, after they lost the battle with the British, uh, they were taken to France. And uh, they lived and never returned to Egypt. But one of their sons came back in 1840. And he was pure Syrian. He married an Italian in Alexandria. They had... Ten children, one of their daughters married a Belgian. They had one son, that's my father. And my father married a Maltese, and that's me. So figure it out, I don't know what the hell I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do speak, I, I, I grew up speaking French. French was the uh, social language, of course, Arabic. And I was sent to an English school, and uh, my mother, coming from a Maltese Italian background, we spoke Italian at home. And uh, well, I'm sort of jet lagged now. I'm kind of hopping from one language to the other in my mind. Yeah? So if I say weird words in strange language, don't worry. <laughs> okay, that's me. Uh, I'm an engineer by profession. I left Egypt when I was 19. Uh, I. Uh, that was just before the Six-Day War. Any of you old enough to remember? Six-Day War with Israel. And uh, I wanted to avoid drafting. I wasn't keen at all to join the, this crazy battle. And so I went to England. And I did my studies there. And I became an engineer like good people. You know, in those days, you became doctors or engineers or dentists yeah. or lawyers. And. Uh, after that, in 73, I started working. I didn't want to work in England. I hate the cold, by the way. I'm one of these guys complaining about the air conditioning, in case you, you feel warmer now. And uh, I took a job. My first job was in the Sultanate of Oman, in the, near the Yemen. I was 22 years old, and I carried on working in the Middle East and Africa. I worked, I worked in Oman. After that, I worked in... Sudan, in Iran, before the days of the Shah. I worked in Saudi Arabia, in Guinea, in Ivory Coast. And after 10 years, I had children. My wife said, it's enough, you know. Uh, I went to settle in Australia uh, for three years. I didn't like it. Beautiful country, but it didn't suit me. They thought I was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Kept speaking about pyramids. I should tell you this because I changed profession, I decided, and you'll know why when I tell you my story, but being a, an engineer, you know, and everybody was used to me being an engineer, going to work and coming back home, you know, and, and then I said I want to write books about ancient Egypt and the pyramids. And uh, when I went to Australia, my mother wasn't sure about all this, and so whenever they said, what, what does your son do, you know? And instead of saying he's writing books about the pyramid, which is pretty weird, yeah? she said I was a consultant. I've got to tell you this. I had a, uh, my son was two years old, and we arrived in Australia, and we sent him to a... I like, I like blabbering. I'll, I'll get to the talk, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> my son was two years old, and we sent him to kindergarten, day schools, how do you call them? And, uh, 
the first day, we got a call. Seriously, this is true. We got a call from the teacher, and she said, can, can we see you? And I thought, my God, he must have done something. You know. And I go there and I said, well, listen, it's very strange. We were asking the kids what daddy does. You know, and some were saying, daddy is a doctor. And, and when it came to him, he said, daddy is a gypsy. So he said, and she said, but he said, then he said something very weird. He said he works for King Tut. <laughs> so let, let me explain. I said, what he meant is, I come from Egypt. You know. So that's how I, I lived for three years in Australia. <laughs> Although I researched my first book there. Anyway, let me tell you all about it. What I would like to talk tonight is, I'll talk about how I did this because. I'm sucking a mint. Uh, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to do two things. One is that being from an engineering background, and I had to study astronomy because of the work I do, or the books I write, uh, I don't want you to think that I'm not into metaphysics. Because ultimately, what I've been studying is ancient Egypt, which is a very metaphysical kind of culture, and particularly uh, the pyramids of Egypt. They're metaphysical monuments, although they're physical. I call the Great Pyramid the metaphysical machine, and I'll explain that as we go along. But uh, my first and only experience, which I would call a metaphysical experience, uh, happened to me not in Egypt, happened to me in Italy. And it was 2003. I had written already several books, and it's a long story, but um, when I was in England, I was sent to the, to the Franciscan schools, and I got to admire a lot of the Franciscan priests, hardworking and missionaries, and, and I got in my mind that I wanted to write an article about St. Francis of Assisi. And it so happened, I'd just seen this wonderful film, I don't know if you've seen it, Franco Zeffirelli's Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, if you haven't, you'll find it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah you have it. And I thought, I'd, I'd, I'd like to go and see Assisi and, and see what's, what's there, you know, why, why did a man like Francis of Assisi... By the way, it's very relevant for tomorrow's talk, because, of course, we have a Francis Pope now and, and a Jesuit Pope. Uh, so I went. And I wasn't really impressed. You know, very touristy, and they were selling postcards, and uh, it's a beautiful place. This is a lovely place. I don't know if any of you have been there. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's in the Umbria area with lovely villages on the mountain. But it didn't do it for me. It just didn't. And I was kind of disappointed, and I was driving out of the town. I saw a, a, a poster in, a, in one of these tourist shops, and it says, visit the sacred stream of Francis of Assisi, in the Abruzzo. Abruzzo is a mountain region between Rome and the Adriatic. And so off I went, I had a rented car, driving, driving, and arrived very late in this very small village called Campotosta. And I didn't know this village, and it's one of those sort of villages where all the men have left to look for work in the city, and there's all these old women dressed in black outside, and it looked very sad and miserable, but beautiful area. It was summer, weather was great, and I booked into this small hotel, it was late, and I said, what do you do here? It said, nothing. You, know, yeah. you, you can sit outside with us. You know. <laughs> Dress in black. You know. And I went to sleep early. And in the middle of the night, it must have been about 4 o'clock in the morning, I woke up. And it's one of those old, Hotels that had high ceilings and this very large window, they called them Persian windows with wooden flaps. And, and I opened it, it was rather hot. And there was a, sh a light shining from somewhere, probably a window or something. And right in front of me outside was a white cloud, and it was made up of tiny, tiny flies, summer flies. There must have been a million, maybe a billion of them. It formed this white cloud. What was weird is that they were moving together, so left and right and up and down. And the thought came in my mind, 
how did they know, all of them, to move in the same direction? Who tells them this? You know, which is the boss fly that kind of tells them, huh? <laughs> and with this thought in mind, I thought I'd go out and have a walk. I didn't feel like sleeping. So I got out of the hotel. It was closed. I actually had to jump out of the window. The wrong hotel, I closed. <laughs> and <laughs> visualize the scene. It was, it was perched on a, on a little hill, and below was a lake. It's still kind of early dawn, still darkish. And I go out, beautiful landscape, and I stop. And I think there's something wrong with me. I'm, I'm not feeling well here. So I got this weird impression, and I'm serious, I got this weird impression that the plants were talking. Now, I thought I'm going crazy. You know, I must have eaten something. Or... And I walk a bit further, and there was a group of a flock of blackbirds flying over me. They had spotted me. I was the only one outside flying over me. And while all this was happening, I could hear the, 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 the frogs croaking on the lake and a few fish jumping. And I became very alert about this. And I felt very, very strange. I go down, and there's a little wood. I go into the wood, and it gets dark full of trees, very dense trees, and I see the stream, and I think maybe that's the stream of St. Francis, you know, I found it. I cross it, not a very large stream, I cross it and I pop out on the other side of this little wood. And as close as you are was a huge male boar with tusks. And they forgot to tell me at the hotel that this place is inhabited by wild boars. I'm serious, and I don't know if you've seen a wild boar. They're pretty big stuff, they're about this big. And he was surprised, I was surprised. I froze. And he began to snort, and he did like a bull does. He began to kick the dust, and he was going to charge. And I thought, this is crazy, I'm, I'm going to be killed by a wild boar in Italy. <laughs> this, it's not possible. I mean, this is my destiny being... And with all this in mind, I'm telling you a true story, with all this in mind, I was desperately trying to tell this boar that I do not mean any harm. And I don't know how I did it, and I'm 100% sure he understood. And it's like he read me, like he read me. And he relaxed, he even wagged his tail. I'm serious. You could feel him relax. I, I, I swear he blinked, I'm not sure, but it looked like he blinked. And he turned around and walked away. And at that moment, that moment, the sun rose over the hills. And there was a kind of movement all around. The birds started singing, the fish started jumping, and I felt for, I don't know, maybe 15 seconds, 30 seconds, it never happened again in my life, I felt plugged in. I felt like some, I got plugged into the whole thing. I felt like I was connected to everything that was moving, the sun, the, the, the fish, the, the boar, the whole thing. And it lasts for 30 seconds. And I've been trying to get this feeling again, and I can't find it. But I know it's there. And I can't explain it. And that, to me, is metaphysics. When you have to accept something, because it did happen, but you cannot explain it. You cannot put it on an equation. You can't put it on a mathematical equation. And now, I'll tell you about the pyramids. <laughs> but before I do... <laughs> oh dear. Something says, firewall is off. Firewall is off. Close. Uh, help. <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay. I'm going to go on the airline thing. Eh? Now, don't, don't get surprised by what you're going to see now. Uh, believe me, it's relevant. There you go. <laughs> what, what you're seeing is an aeroplane. <laughs> it actually is a tri-star from the Saudi Arabian Airlines. 
the Saudiya. And uh, I worked five years in the city of Riyadh. And in fact, it is in the city of Riyadh that I made my discovery, which I'll tell you about in, a, in about two minutes, three. <laughs> so I want to tell you about this first to make a point. This will be very relevant to this talk and especially tomorrow's talk. Um, I had been there for quite a while, three years. I've been working at the time as an engineer. And I was alone in an office. I was a commercial engineer. I had a secretary, a Sudanese secretary, and I sent him to buy an airline ticket. I wanted to fly from Riyadh to Jeddah to see one of my clients. And he came back very excited, very nervous, and he said, there's something wrong. The agency says they cannot sell tickets. They've closed the airport. And I thought, oh my god, there's a coup d'etat, there's, there's a revolution, there's something. And within a few minutes, I kept getting phone calls from friends of mine saying the same thing, there's something wrong, the, the airlines are closed, the travel agents are not allowed to sell tickets, there's a problem. And the problem was very weird. The problem was very weird. But I'll show you these pictures first, and then I'll tell you what happened. The king of Saudi Arabia, was about to board, it was King Khaled at the time, 1981, and he was about to board the royal plane. It was a tri-star like this, and he had all his retinue and his uh, officers, and he had what they call a mutawa. A mutawa is a priest. He kind of walks behind them and reads the Quran, you know, and the beard, you know. And, and suddenly this mutawa froze. Now, there's something you may or may not know about Saudi Arabia. They don't allow other religions to practice there. You cannot practice Christianity or Judaism, any other religion. And you cannot show any, any signs of this religion. You're not allowed to wear crosses, you're not allowed to wear Star of David or whatever. No churches, no nothing. It's very strict. And the Mutawa suddenly said, don't go on this flight because it bears the Christian cross. Where? 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 Let's see if you see it. Look, look very carefully at this picture. It's kind of weird. Do you see the cross? Well, nobody did. The king was puzzled. Everybody was puzzled. Uh, here is... Oops, what have I done here? Yeah, there it is. That's the plane. You see it from two perspectives. Here it is here. Look very carefully. Well, I'll tell you what he saw. I'll just cut a long story short. Look between the first two letters, S and A. Yeah. You see it now? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Unless I told you about this, you wouldn't have noticed because you don't look at what we call image in ground. But the minute you see it, that's it. The whole country was flooded with crosses. It was on the airlines, it was on the tickets, it was on the shops, it was on the napkins, it was on the teacups, it was everywhere. The worst nightmare that could happen in Saudi Arabia, there was crosses all over the place. And the king knew, because he was told by his alchemist Mutawas, if you leave this, Everybody's going to talk about this cross. Every time they board an aircraft, they say, did you notice there's a cross between the thing and the white thing? Every time they look at a napkin. We've got to change it. And they did. They stopped everything for one week, and they changed it, and that's what they did. There you are. It's a true story. But the reason I'm telling you this, this is an example. It's obviously a coincidence. I'm sure that... It wasn't intended. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Because once it was there, it became active. It became what is known as a talisman. It works on the mind. You know, very simple talismans are, well, the most, a wedding ring, for example. You know, it's not just an object. It's not just a ring. It's charged with meaning. It has meaning but it has meaning to the person who knows the meaning. Well, in this case, everybody did. 
There are, there are, there are talismans. A talisman can be anything, provided it has meaning. In fact, we're walking talismans in many ways. I mean, you know who I am, therefore I mean something, you know, I hope about my work. But it can be anything. And of course, it can be very negative to some people, very positive to Christian people, of course. Uh, there is a number, I'll, I'll close on talismans. I want you to think about this, because what you will be seeing is how ancient Egyptians, particularly the pyramid builders, built a talisman that was meant forever. It's one of, one of those, the pyramids. But <clears throat> there is one that is in fact a number. It's a very negative one. It's very dark, it conjures all sorts of horrors. Can you think of that number? Nine, eleven? Now, before 9-11, it didn't have that meaning. But suddenly, you don't need to explain it anymore. You tell people 9-11, and suddenly this horror comes. And believe me, it's become a universal talisman, not just in America, everywhere. And it will be, have this connotation for centuries, for thousands of years. When people will say 9-11, it will mean this. Do you understand? So, it's one of those difficult things to understand talismans, but these are good examples to let you know. So now, is he going to talk about the pyramids or not, huh? <laughs> Let's see now. I'm supposed to press this. Press that. Oh, we got it. Okay, here we go. I'll tell you my story. I was minding my own business in 1983, working as an engineer, earning good money in Saudi Arabia. And I took a trip to see my mother, who still lived in Alexandria in Egypt. I flew from Saudi Arabia to Cairo, I rented a car, and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got a bit of time, I'll stop at the Cairo Museum. By the way, how many of you have been to Cairo, to Egypt? One, two, three, four, okay, majority have not. Well, you know about this museum, you've seen it on television, it's Tahrir Square, and eh? Tahrir Square has become a talisman, iconic, to the Egyptians at least, Tahrir Square, Freedom Square. And I went inside, I had a camera. This was 1983, before digital and internet and mobile phones, and I had a camera with black and white film. And I came across this picture, it's still there, it's an overhead picture of the pyramids. Three pyramids of Giza. I'll put it in, I've got a better, there we can see it better here. Uh, I'll use the pointer. Uh, the Great Pyramid, of course, here. The second and the third. Famous three pyramids of Egypt, of Giza. Now, it so happened I was, I was one of these frame of minds. I, I, I was thinking about going to Alexandria. I'd been working. My specialty at the time was as a what, what was known as a setting out engineer. I'm the poor guy who was in the rain with theodolites and measuring tapes, and they set out roads and buildings. And when something isn't right, it just annoys me. It just annoys me, yeah. So I don't know why I'm looking at you, but <laughs> you're not annoying me. <laughs> I have to apologize, I've got this very bizarre sense of humor. Uh, you know, when you visit people and you're having dinner and you're sitting at the table and opposite there is a painting or a picture and it's kind of skew with, you know this feeling? And it begins to bug you and you can't wait to have the opportunity to go and, you know, to, you know what I mean? Well. It bugged me. You know, you had two pyramids of equal size on a diagonal. This is the north-south axis, we call this the meridian. And the third one was much smaller and offset. You know, I just <laughs> didn't want it to. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is annoying. 
I mean, two things bug me. Why? Well, why is it smaller for a start? I mean, you know, the, the small stuff didn't work for me because from what I'd read, and I'd been in Egypt for 19 years, from what I'd read about this, all these pharaohs are supposed to be megalomaniacs, you know, and they want to show how powerful they were. I mean, well, you can imagine being the architect of the third one, and, <laughs> and he tells the pharaoh, sorry, but you're not as big as the other guys, you know. You're not as powerful. Sorry, I'm going to make you a smaller pyramid, right? And to annoy you, I'm going to offset it as well. <laughs> it didn't work for me. It didn't look like one of these ego problems. What I knew, because I mean, I was an engineer, I looked at plans, this looked like a plan to me. But what did it mean? I mean, why two big diagonal small offset? And then this offset, it's just, just one of those things, you know? Now, you can't move it, right? <laughs> well, you can with Photoshop now these days, right? And with that in mind, I took a picture. I had my camera and I... And I went back to Saudi Arabia. I made various copies. And I said, I'm going to annoy my friends as well. <laughs> I'm going to send it around to my friends' engineers, and I've got surveyors, I've got architects, all these people who are sort of get annoyed with this sort of thing. And I invited them, and I said, here is a picture. And they all said the same thing. It's really, why is it offset? Why, what, is there a meaning to this? You know, is it just like that? I mean, why is it smaller? They always asked the same question. And I got stuck with this. Now, there is one thing amazing about this three pyramids. And of course, most amazing is this one. You, this picture, by the way, is probably taken from about two kilometers up. If you haven't seen these pyramids, if you haven't seen the Great Pyramid, I had a, an apartment about here. I actually lived in front of it for three years. It, it's one of those monuments that it's just crazy. It really is. It's like it should not be there, you know? It's like, it's like it's landed from somewhere else. It's too big. It's too precise. It's too mysterious. It's one of the things that has baffled and still baffling people is that it is set, the base is set so that each side faces precisely the cardinal directions, not magnetic directions, cardinal, astronomical directions. Precise. In fact, the error, the error is 5% of a single degree. It's bullseye. It's Swiss watch accuracy. It's that good. And it's supposedly done without optical instruments, without anything, but sticks and stones. And brutal manpower. That's what we hear. The second one and the third one. The third one isn't small. We say the small pyramid, but in fact it's 65 meters high. It's a huge pyramid. But you put it next to the other two, and we call it the small pyramid. You know, it's like parking your car next to a bus. You know, and you have a big car, but you put it next to a bus, and people say it's smaller. What? explained this small pyramid. It sort of bugged me. Bugged me, bugged me, bugged me, and I said, I've got to read about it. Now, the annoying thing about this site, the annoying thing about this particular pyramid, now, let me set you in time. They're supposed to have been built by the fourth dynasty, by three kings. King Khufu, or known as Cheops, Khafra, the second one, or Hephren, as the Greeks called him, and Menkara. Father, son, and grandson. And the strange thing about this, it, it is set about 2500 BC. That is the official Egyptological consensus. 2500 BC, built by these three kings and their tombs. That's it. The weirdest thing is this, being not just the offset and it's smaller and why is it like that, is that you do not find 
inscriptions, either inside or outside. Now we know that the ancient Egyptians, particularly of this period, knew how to write, and they wrote a lot. If you visit Egypt, you will see temples are loaded with inscriptions. Tombs are loaded with inscriptions. They love to write. Now, if you had built the greatest monument ever, the Great Pyramid is 146 meters high. It's six million tons of material. I can give you statistics if you want. If you dismantle it and you build a wall about that high, you go around the world. There are blocks in there that weigh about 80 tons in the King's Chamber, I'll tell you a bit later. If you had built this monument, if you were the pharaoh who had commissioned this monument, wouldn't you want to have your name on it? I mean, I usually say this, since we have, I'm in a publishing place here, I've written a book, I send it to my publishers, they make the cover, they put the title, and they don't put my name. <laughs> I'll call the publisher and I'll say, hey! <laughs> right? If you come to my uh, workshop, if you can, there is a, I don't know if you've heard this in the news, by the way, there's been quite a scandal in Egypt going on, it's still, still brewing. Two Germans have uh, broken, well, have entered some secret chambers in the pyramid and have, they were accused of stealing the name of the king because the name of the king does appear in this pyramid. But it is a graffito. This is actually drawn by probably a worker and it was closed in an inner chamber. You haven't heard about this? No. It's a huge scandal. There was Interpol involved. And amazingly, because I, I don't know if you've been watching these documentaries, I'm in big conflict with the ex-minister of antiquities, Zahi Hawass, you know the guy with the hat? You know the man, the, the nasty one? <laughs> I've been fighting him for years, and he's accused me <laughs> of paying the Germans <laughs> to steal this cartouche. You know why? You know why? Because I was trying to prove that the Jews and the Israeli build the pyramid. That's what he says. Put me in danger, actually. I've got my friend... Mildred Curiel, who came to Egypt with me, and we were, had to explain this to the newspapers. I'm telling you this because if you come to the conference, it's an amazing story, because we're on the verge. We're on the verge. These Germans did something extraordinary. They, they did this for scientific reasons. They took some samples off a place in the king's chamber. They took some stuff off the wall, and they think they found something that should not be there. If you want to know about it, come to my workshop, huh? No, no, it's true. I'm deeply involved with this. We've been investigating for six months. Unfortunately, there's people in jail because of this. Uh, Mildred and I have been campaigning with various Egyptians to try and get the six Egyptians who were with these Germans. They didn't know what they were doing, but they've been put in jail. So we've been campaigning to get them out of jail. Anyway, if you do come, right? <coughs> So, they're devoid of official inscriptions. It's true that there is graffito, but the graffito that is written is hidden, was hidden in chambers that were not discovered until 1837. Uh, I'll explain the interior of the pyramid in a minute. So anyway, on we go. The mystery of the offset. Now, the thing is here, okay? I mean, they could have placed it there, right? And nobody would ask any questions. Still about the small thing. Well, to avoid the small thing, why not put them all in a row and that's it? You know, that's it. Everybody's happy. King, son, grandson. No mystery. Fasten your seatbelt. We're going there. Let's go and examine. Egypt. Google, you all do this Google stuff these days, no? Egypt is basically a river. It's a river, we're here at the borders of Sudan, and it extends roughly from south to north. It is roughly 
a meridional river. You always know your directions in Egypt because you know the Nile runs from, north, from south to north. And as you're there, all you have to do is be near the Nile and you say, this is east, this is west, this is... It fans out and forms the so-called delta. And we're going to go here. The pyramids of Giza are there. We're approaching the famous Giza Plateau. Now, I've done a Photoshop thing. This is the Giza Plateau without the pyramids. There's this huge polemic with Egyptologists. You know, how long did it take to build those pyramids? You know, they used to say 100 years, and then somehow they, they came down to 30, and then they came down to 20, and now they tell us eight years. I can tell you, nobody knows. Nobody knows how long it took. I'm going to put them there in two seconds. Okay, here's one, and two, and three. Okay. <laughs> we have the three pyramids of Giza. Now, why did these people develop at a very early stage? Why did they have this incredible culture? And why did they build pyramids? And why did they place them in the way you've seen? And it all comes to one phenomena, the Nile. The Nile, until the 19th century, puzzled everybody. It flows through a desert. On each side of the Nile is a desert, sand. Without the Nile, Egypt is dry as a bone. Nothing can live there. The Nile flows from somewhere in the south. We know now that it is from the highlands of Ethiopia and from Central Africa and the Uganda, where there are rains, the monsoons, they fill up and they feed the Nile. But we didn't know this until the 19th century, the mystery of the source of the Nile. But the Nile has a greater mystery. It floods once a year. Let's see, I've, kind of, I've done a Photoshop thing. There you are. And it floods to overflow the land on each side, and it forms the Nile Valley. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of nature. It irrigates the land on its own. When the Greeks came to Egypt in the fourth century, they said this is paradise. And it was like a paradise. The people didn't even work. They just lived in this amazing place where the land was irrigated naturally and fertilized naturally because the flood waters not only watered the land, but it brought fertilizers from Central Africa, detritus, broken pits of trees and whatever. And it fed the land. The crops grew on their own like magic. But the weirdest thing is that the flood occurred when you expect it less. It occurred, what are we now? The summer solstice. It occurred in the height of the summer, in the hottest time of year, when you'd expect the water to ebb, to go down. It completely mystified them. Why would the water rise when it was the hottest time of year. No rain, nothing to show more water, and yet this water rises. It puzzled them and puzzled them and puzzled them, and they began to look at an explanation. The first thing they noticed, which is true, is that it was the summer solstice. Tomorrow morning, by the way, is the summer solstice, 21st of June. Summer solstice, the longest, day of the year and the hottest, theoretically, day of the year. The sun is at its highest altitude at noon. Here is a picture taken in 1872 from a balloon. This is how the Nile would flood near the pyramids. It turned into sort of like Venice. It's a huge, huge lake. The whole country became a kind of magical setting. They traveled by, sh by boats. Huh? I still remember this when I was a kid. It doesn't flood anymore now, where well, it still floods, but the flood waters do not come because of the high dam that they built in Aswan, further south. The high dam holds 11 floods. Should it ever break, it will completely destroy Egypt. So, but this was taken at the time when it still flooded until night. The last flood was in 1965. I was in my teens. And 
Now, if you go to Egypt, all this is built areas with hotels and all this stuff. Here is another picture of the Nile in flood. It must have been beautiful. Apparently, there, it attracted all sorts of fauna, and there was fish and pelicans and parrots, and kids would swim. And Here is the, the water got very, very close to the pyramids, by the way. And you can see a reflection. And here it is without the flood, how it is today. Um, now, I want to avoid doing astronomy because I'll be doing that at the workshop, if you come. I'll be doing real sky astrology, so I'll be talking about this, but just very quickly. Now, some of you may know this, but if you watch sunrise, if you watch sunrise through the year, uh, I'm standing here looking due east. Now, at the summer solstice, the sun would reach what we call a maximum northerly amplitude. In Egypt, it's about 28 degrees from due east. Here, I don't, I'm not quite sure what latitude we are. What latitude we are, Can anybody? It probably is a bit more than Egypt, but roughly, you'll be see the same thing. If you watch the sun throughout the year, it will go from here six months and back six months, right? Summer solstice, winter solstice. And in the middle, the equinoxes. One occurring uh, this way, which is March, and the other one on the way back, which is September. And it's been doing this forever and ever and ever, since this planet has existed. And it will do this till this planet doesn't exist anymore. It always does this. And it's very easy to know how long it takes. You just count the days. One, two, three, four, five, six, you count six months, and you get 365, right? and a bit. Now, we adjust for this bit, which is a quarter of a day, roughly. In fact, it's not exactly a quarter of a day. It's a little bit less than a quarter of a day. We do adjust every four years. We add a day, and we bring back the calendar, more or less, a leap year. But in fact, it's a bit different. Apparently, we'll have to readjust it properly in 3,000 years. Don't worry about it, we won't be here. It's just a little bit more. But the Egyptians were the first to do this. They established the very first calendar, a 365-day calendar, solar calendar. It probably was done around 3000 BC. But what they noticed is when the sun was here, which would be tomorrow, if you're in Egypt, the sun will be at its maximum position. It doesn't go any further, that's it. It's reached its maximum position. We call it the solstice, by the way. Whoops. <laughs> End of talk. <laughs> we call it the solstice because, in Latin, it means stationary sun. The sun appears to be stationary. Now, let me tell you what happens. It takes three months from due east, from March to here, right? It will move, bang, 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 bang. It takes three months. But it moves faster, 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 slower, 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 slow. It's like a car braking. And it will sit there for about seven days. It's at its solstice. And then it begins to move back. And the Egyptian noticed that when it was at its solstice, the Nile would flood. First thing they noticed. And they began to think it's something to do with the sun. They weren't far wrong. They weren't far wrong because as the sun reaches its highest point, way south in Uganda and Ethiopia, it melts the snows, it causes the monsoon, and it causes the flood. They didn't know this, but they guessed it correctly. It's something to do with the sun. But, but, this is a reconstruction. Again, if you come to my, keep saying this. I'm trying to attract customers, by the way. <laughs> if you come to my workshop, this is a reconstruction from a virtual reality astronomical program. It's called Sky Night, Starry Night Sky. And you're looking at the sky about, you see here very faintly, I've written Orion. Can you read this? If you were in Egypt at the time of the pyramid builders, 
and you were there in the pre-dawn, as the sky was slowly getting light, you would see the constellation of Orion rising, <coughs> dominating the skyline, it's still dark. You're about an hour and a bit from sunrise. And they noticed this. They noticed that this constellation would herald, if you like, the summer solstice. By the way, if you're interested, um, again, I'll be talking about this tomorrow, but the three stars of Orion's belt, or Orion's belt are known as the three kings. In the Christian folklore, they probably represent the three kings, the three magis. They herald, they're herald stars. They kind of welcome, and you'll see what it welcomes. It welcomes the star of the east. It welcomes a very special star, and here it is. The sky brightens, you can't see the constellation anymore, but one star pops out. It's the star Sirius, the star Sirius. The Egyptians identified it to the goddess Isis. It is the star of rebirth. It is the star of the rebirth of the Nile. And it actually performs a rebirth. If you would observe the stars over a period of time, over the year, taking Sirius as an example, you would see it for the last time in the sky in the west, not the east. You would see it in the west, just, just over the horizon, over the horizon, after sunset. So the sky is bright, the, the sun hasn't set yet, the, su the sun sets, the star appears because it's dark and it hovers over the horizon and then it sinks, it sets. And then you don't see it for 70 days. It's gone under the earth. It's dead. And the Egyptians were mystified by this. And they waited, and they waited, and you wait 70 days. And then, as if by miracle, it appears again at dawn. They called it, it was reborn at dawn. The star pops out after 70 days, and it shines for a few seconds. This is a virtual reality picture. If you can see it on a clear day, best thing in the desert or at sea, it sparkled purple. It's an amazing sight. It pops out, it sends a spark, and then the sky brightens, just for a few seconds. It's the color of these T-shirts that you bought. In fact, the reason that they, the color purple, by the way, is the color of Isis, because of this star. And so they began to think, it's the star. It's the star that causes the flood. We understand the mechanism. It's the star of rebirth, and on this star they build a whole mythology. They associate it to a goddess that gave birth. They gave birth. Now, let me go through a bit. Let's see what we have here afterwards. Here's an actual picture of the rising of Sirius. Here is Orion. You can see two characters here, and the star is rising. I have some nicer pictures, let's see, there it is. This, that's an actual, known as helical rising, rising before the sun, the first dawn rising of the star. There it is. It occurs now on the 5th of August in Egypt. It's no more on the summer solstice because of a phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes. And don't run away, I will explain to you, it's very simple. In a minute. The Nile. The Nile Valley. As it gets irrigated, and here are the pyramids. Oop, whoops, and help! Help! Ah, it's back. Curse of the Pharaoh, something... What, what? Do you see them here? Now, the Nile is north-south, the pyramids are at an angle, you've seen the picture, and the little one offset, right? Oh. It doesn't change. Help! <laughs> okay. It froze. Ah, okay, I'll use that. 
Okay, it works? Okay, you see them very well now. And Lotus, I mean, you can see very well the alignment of the two and the offset, right? These are Google images. You get them in 3D, by the way, these days. Yeah. Here they are again. Here they are. Fufu, Hafra, Menkara. The Egyptians give them names. I mean, it's really boring. G1, G2, and G3. Remember? Anyway, G1, G2, and G3. G1, G2, and G3. The axis of the pyramid. The entrance, by the way, is in the north. If you'd walk around the pyramid, by the way, it would take you half an hour. It's two, each side is about 230 meters. There are, well, I'll have an overhead pictures, I think, later on. There are people there, but they're too small to see. They look like ants. The interior of the pyramid, I'll go very fast because I have better pictures. You will enter from the north, you go down underground, and there is a so-called subterranean chamber. This is a graphic picture, of course. You go up an ascending passage, along a horizontal passage, and you enter what is known as the Queen's Chamber, and then the Grand Gallery here and the King's Chamber. And there are shafts shooting up. These are the key to the pyramid. These shafts, you've heard about these shafts, and huh? the mysterious shafts of the pyramid. Okay, here is a sketch of it. Enter from the original entrance, down the chamber, ascending passage. We have, who's been in there, by the way? Anybody been there? One, two, three, four, five, six, quite a few. It's pretty eerie, isn't it? We were there a few weeks ago. I'm pointing at my friend, uh, Mildred. And uh, by the way, here you can see Here's the king's chamber, and above it, above it, are five so-called relief chambers. They're the most mysterious thing on this planet. And again, if you come to the workshop, because I really want to tell you about this latest event, I think we're going to break it. I think we're going to break this pyramid. I mean, break the code. We're that close, that close. There is two things that are going to happen in the next few months. One's to know what is this mysterious product that they have found. And I can tell you, I'm pretty stunned. I know what it is, but I won't tell you now. <laughs> and the other is the opening of the famous doors that have been closed at the end of the shafts. We have a new Minister of Antiquities that was appointed yesterday, and we're in dialogue with him, yes. He's a fellow called Mamdouh Damwati, and he's a nice guy, I know him. We're going to try and persuade him. All right, we'll avoid this. I'm going to skip here. I'm going to go, here. by the way, this is, <laughs> brings back weird memories. This is a Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> Cherokee. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the story, but it blew up. <laughs> I, it actually blew up on me, this car. It was built in Egypt. I switched on the air conditioning and I jumped out. It caught fire, literally, and I had 70 liters of fuel in it. It's like the movies, you know, I felt like... Pew. Anyway, that's another story. But you're looking at pyramids, much smaller pyramids, of the 5th dynasty, following the great pyramids of Giza. And these, these are loaded with texts, in contrast to the 4th dynasty. They're smaller, they're shoddier, they're really poor building, but they are loaded with text. It's as if they wanted to say what the other pyramids are saying, but not in written language. There is a famous phrase from a French Egyptologist who discovered the texts, the famous pyramid texts. Let's see if we have a picture of them. There they are. If you enter the pyramids of the 5th dynasty at Saqqara, about 8 kilometers further south, you'll see these texts, loaded with texts. By the way, they're the oldest, oldest religious texts in the world. They predate the Bible by a few thousand years. They are genuine, untouched. They're carved on the wall. They're not edited. And you see at the top here, the ceiling is studded with stars. 
and you'd expect that they'd speak about stars, and they do. And they, sp and they speak about the rebirth of the king. Their instructions of how to attain rebirth inside a pyramid. So let's read them. Of course, we won't read all of them. <laughs> By the way, you can get them on, on internet now. You know, they're all online these days. So you just press pyramid text online and you'll get them translated in English. Uh, there are very good translations. There is a close-up of it. They're pristine, by the way. They were discovered in 1882. They were untouched. I saw them about a century later. They were, they're untouched. They're amazingly cut. It's like laser cutting. One of the good translators is by this guy, but there's many. An American did the translation lately, Professor Allen. I think he's from... Uh, Boston University, I'm not sure, but worth reading his translation. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go very quickly. By the way, I have to watch my time. Another hour. Are you having fun? Yeah. <laughs> very quickly, the mythology. This is the cosmology of the ancient Egyptians. The cosmology of the ancient Egyptians. They believed that there was a creator called Atum, Ra. From him emerged a couple, which they identified as the moisture and the air. From them came the physical, visible world, the goddess of the sky, Nut or Nut, and the god of the earth, the physical world. And from this couple emerged the four anthropomorphic, human-shaped gods, two couples, Osiris and Isis, and Seth and Nephthys. I won't bother with the details, but uh, Osiris got killed by his jealous brother, so the myth goes. And his body is cut into many pieces, 14 pieces, they say. Isis reconstructs the body, and creates the first mummy. She is childless. She hasn't yet given birth. She performs the sexual act with Osiris when she resurrects him. She becomes pregnant and gives birth to Horus, the first divine child. He is born from the womb of the star goddess. Serious. Should remind you a bit of... No? the Christic mythology, the birth of Jesus, the appearance of the star, the virgin. And here is some passages from the pyramid text. The king, when he dies, we read, becomes a star. Somehow, this monument is the hardware of a process that will transform the dead king, the physical body of the dead king, into a spiritual entity. They used to call this the, the Ba. And he would travel and become a star. And he becomes a star in the constellation of Orion. Many passages. This is a lovely one. Um, now, they're of course intensely occult. They weren't meant for us to sort of read here. They were closed inside the pyramid. They were supposed to perform a magical, a magical event. The big question that haunts me is that they went to a lot of trouble. They went to a lot of trouble building the Great Pyramid that you've seen. They went to a lot of trouble. It is an incredible thing that they did. They mobilized the nation for 10, 20, 30, maybe 100 years to perform this transfiguration. There is no question that at least from their point of view, they believed they could do it. They believed that they could convert a physical body into a spiritual entity. And that bugs me. Because it's very hard for me, being an engineer, to consider this. 
Is it possible? Is it possible? Did they know something? Were they able to do something that we have no idea? No idea. But they, one thing for sure, they needed the pyramid. I usually compare it to a computer. I know it's a kind of hard analogy, but the computer is totally useless. It's the hardware, the mesh, it's just the hardware. If you do not put a program in it, if you do not put a software, if it doesn't have a processor, the energy, the electricity to make it work, is just a piece of plastic and metal. That's what the pyramid is now. It's stone. But it had its software. It had its processor. And it seems, you will see now, it seems that the processor that they had in mind was the machinery of the sky. A perpetual machine that seems to turn around them, the stars and the sun, constantly. And the software, the software was the initiated person who went in there. It seems that this is what they had in mind and they think it worked. The weirdest thing about the Pyramid Age to this day, we have not found any physical remains of any corpse. Not a single bone, not a single hair. Whoever was put in there have disappeared. We do not have the mortal remains of the kings who were supposedly put inside this pyramid. And I tell you, I wake up sometimes and I say, no, Robert, Robert, come on, you keep your feet on the ground. I mean, it's... And sometimes you think, maybe they did it. Maybe they did it. And I've coined this phrase with my colleague. Uh, you've heard of Graham Hancock, I presume? Yes? We don't know what to call it, and we call it the science of immortality. They seem to have had this science. That's, you feel it. If you study this, if you get involved with this, I've been on this for 30 years, and believe me, I'm one of these very resistant skeptics. But sometimes you think, maybe they did it. And maybe that's why it's worth pursuing it. Maybe that's why it's worth knowing they've built something that is there. And how annoying, how absurd. They probably would die in shame to think that we think they're just tombs. It's one of those things. Bear this in mind, because I have to say, I cannot tell you they did it, and I cannot tell you they didn't do it. But all I can tell you is my feeling. I just... You go in there, and it's, we are in the 21st century. We don't know how. We don't know how they move these blocks. We think we know a bit now because of what you might hear at this workshop, because of what these Germans have found. We don't know. And we're supposed to know. We can send people on the moon. We're about to send people in Mars. We have flying machines. We have satellites flowing about. We have cell phones. We have computers. And we don't know how they build this pyramid. I've talked to engineers. I've talked to architects, structural engineers, experts. And they don't know how it was done. It's that monument. There's nothing like it on this planet. There's a lot of other weird monuments, it's sure. But this one, this is the one. Anyway, let's proceed here. Uh, here is how they depicted the constellation of Orion. They called it Sa, and it's a striding man uh, holding a star. Here's another one. Now, here is a strange thing. They gave names to pyramids. Here is a pyramid of the fourth dynasty of a king called Jedefra. And they actually call the pyramid by his name. The pyramid becomes, in a sense, the king. But it becomes the king when he's a star. This pyramid is actually called Jedifra, is a shining star. The pyramid is a star. It's a virtual star. It is an architectural star. Call it what you like. It becomes a star in their mind. Here is, I've projected the images of Osiris and Isis. 
Here she is in the constellation of Canis Major with the star Sirius and Osiris. Here is how it appeared to them in the sky, this, this magical couple. Uh, here he is sitting on the throne receiving the pharaohs that arrive in his kingdom inside Orion. They had a name for it, they called it the Duat, the kingdom of Osiris in the sky. It's Duat. Maybe we'll all end up in the Duat. Now, what you're seeing here is a gyroscope, and it doesn't turn because we're not on. Now, we come to this thing, I, I said I want to put it very simply, the precession of the equinoxes. And when I say the precession of the equinoxes, in the old days, people used to walk out of the room and say, that's it, we don't want a lesson in astronomy. And uh, I remember, you have here, and I think she's still alive, the, uh, a professor of astronomy at Maryland University. She actually, she actually worked with an Egyptologist in 1964. And she found that one of the shafts, they were working together, and they published an article showing that one of the shafts of the king's shaft pointed to Orion's belt. The first time that this was discovered. And when I did my first program on television, we called her up to come to the BBC in London to explain about this precession of the equinoxes. And I got a phone call from the producer saying, we can't do it. She's taken the whole program. It takes 50 minutes for her to explain what the precession of the equinoxes is. And you ask any astronomer, and you probably spend the whole day telling you how it is. I'm going to do it in 30 seconds. All right? Time me. You know that this planet is a globe, right? And you know that it turns on its axis in 24 hours, and you get the effects of night and day, where it goes around the sun, right? It revolves around the sun in 365 days, right? Well, it has a third motion. It wobbles. It wobbles very slowly in 26,000 years. Very slowly, like a, like a belly dancing, gyrating, very slowly. And this causes, it appears that the sky is wobbling. In fact, we're wobbling. The stars appear to wobble. That's precession. I think it was 25 seconds, perhaps. We did it. You get it? It's a wobble. That's what it is. The Earth wobbles. And because of this wobble, because of this wobble, we can break into the language of the ancients, certainly of the pyramid builders. We're now discovering that many, many cultures, particularly here in the States, the, the Red Indians, watch this. The Chinese, the Indians in the African continent, many, many cultures, in England even, in Scotland, they observed this strange, slow wobble. Because as the sky appears to wobble, the constellations appear to wobble. A fixed constellation. And if you know, if a monument is aligned to any specific star, you can date it. And that's what they did. Uh, about now, it's at its highest point. Orion is at its highest point. It's roughly about 60 degrees from the horizon. In the Pyramid Age, it was about 45 degrees in alignment with one of the shafts. A shaft shooting from outside, from inside the king's chamber. It was discovered in 1964, and its lowest point is in about 10,500 BC. It will do this up and down in 26,000 years. 13,000 years down, 13,000 years up. It will do this forever because of this wobble. So we have a shaft pointing. We know that they were interested in the constellation. That's what they did. They worked out its position, and they were able to date the pyramid. Zoom, bong. I'm the guy who discovered the alignment of the lower, of the Queen's Chamber, pointing to the star Sirius. The pyramid speaks. It does not speak in text. It does not speak in hieroglyphs. It speaks with the star language. I've coined the phrase astroglyphics. 
It is speaking using the stars. The stars... Now, I'll tell you something very weird as we approach the end of this talk. The pyramid speaks in the language, not just of astronomy. It speaks in a language that is universal. It is using ratios and prime numbers. We would use ratios and prime numbers and astronomical alignment if we wanted to speak to the Chinese, if we want to speak to the Chinese in a thousand years, if we want to speak to somebody on Mars or in a different galaxy. It is the language of the universe. And that adds another mystery to this pyramid. Why would they want it to speak in this language? It's a message, there's no doubt. There's a lot of people working on this at the moment, but anyway, on with the story. Here we are. I've removed, this is a graphic thing, you can see the, the chambers, and here are the shafts pointing to Orion's belt. Here is Orion, let's move quickly here. Lovely picture, this is an actual picture of Orion here, and the star here is following it. And you can see this band of light, this band of light, the Milky Way, we call this the Milky Way, the Egyptians call it the Celestial Nile. The Celestial Nile. Here is another lovely picture. Here is a close-up. Here is Orion's belt, and you can see where we're getting at here. Here is a bigger picture of Orion's belt. Here is the offset. The Orion correlation theory. Cannot be a coincidence. I published this in 1989, and I finally published in a book form in 1994. And boy, I wasn't ready for this. The Egyptologists, the archaeologists, the philologists, everybody with an ist of his name got upset. <laughs> it's been now over nearly 30 years. It's caused a huge, huge polemic. Universities have debated it. It was on Fox television, it was on BBC, it was on CNN, and hell broke loose. Hell broke loose. And suddenly, I'm used to it now, but believe me, it was rather weird when you come up with something that nobody expected. It's a bit like the cross, you know, remember the cross? Once you see it, you see it. <laughs> That's it. And it bugged the Egyptologists no end, I can tell you. They had missed it. They didn't see it. They didn't see it because they didn't want to see it. They wanted to see this as tombs. We have a star map. We have a star map that represents the belt of Orion. We have a star map that represents the belt of Orion, and the pyramid speaks in universal language. It speaks with prime numbers, it speaks with astronomy. And, are you ready for this? I remember, you remember Cosmos, the, 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 the famous series of, they've got a new one now, the Cosmos series? But the original one with Carl Sagan? Huh? You do? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> I remember he coined this amazing phrase. He said, we are star stuff. You are star stuff. This is star stuff. I'm star stuff. There's a star, almost certainly, from within the constellation of Orion. There is, they call it the star nursery, by the way. You can't, oh, well, I'll, let's see if I can get you a nice picture. Oh, it's coming to my book here. You see it here? There's a nebula. It actually gives birth to stars. Stars are being born there now. They're the stars that populated our galaxy. We come from one of these stars. A piece of this star has formed and created this planet around another star, which is our sun. And it took four and a half billion years for this piece of star, which is our planet, to have produced us. And we have become not just star stuff. We are star stuff become conscious.
And if it's true, it's a fact. This is not metaphysics. But there is a metaphysical side to this. Because if we are star stuff, then that star comes from the very, the stuff comes from the very source of the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. It comes from an infinitesimal, absolutely incredibly dense, in unimaginably small particle that was so small, so incredibly dense, that it was just pure energy. And it exploded 13 and a half billion years ago. And within three billion years, there were islands of stars floating about, galaxies containing billions of stars each. We now know that there is over 10 billion of these galaxies, each containing billions upon billions of stars. We're one planet near one star in one of those galaxies. All the evolution of the universe is inside you. You can create the universe. The knowledge is there. The question is, how do you get to it? How do you retrieve it? As you're sitting here, as I'm walking about, this knowledge is keeping me alive. It's pumping blood, it's repairing cells, it's making me talk, it's moving my fingers, it's making me think. Without me doing anything. There's an amazing processor in there that can do extraordinary stuff. It can smell, it can think, it can imagine, it can create. The knowledge is there, how do we get to it? Maybe, maybe the ancient Egyptians did get to it. And maybe it's because they didn't have what we have. They didn't have the cell phone and the computers. They didn't look outside. They looked inside. You can travel inside. It's known as gnosis. Very much into it these days. You can take a journey into the microcosm. And somehow, perhaps, you can reach there, that black box that is there, that knows the secret of our existence. Because here we are in the 21st century, and we have the same fundamental questions. Where do we come from? What are we supposed to do here? Who are we? And where do we go? We think we know kind of where do we come from, the stars, the galaxy. We think we know more or less what we're supposed to do here. Well, we think, huh? It's not democracy, but it might be something else. But we don't know where we go. We don't know where we go. And maybe they did. And that is why it's worth pursuing. It's worth pursuing. And we're breaking a code here. We're breaking a message. We're saying, look at that constellation. There's something there. There's something to understand. I don't know what it is. You don't have to come to my workshop. I won't be able to tell you this. <laughs> but I sense it is there. I sense it's there. 30 years I've been on this thing. There's another. Now, of course, when this came out, usual thing. I felt like a bit like Galileo, you know. They, they couldn't drag me and sort of crucify me or burn me, but I got sort of crucified in the intellectual way. I was a madman, I was a charlatan, I was a crazy new age. Uh, this, this is nonsense, it's not possible that they knew this, but as it began to be seen on television, people saw with their own eyes 
No more arguments. There's a famous quote that I like to quote from Groucho Marx. Remember Groucho Marx, the Marx Brothers? Some of you are old enough? The famous three Marx Brothers, no? You know the one with the cigar? <laughs> your mother, your aunt remembers, huh? He had this famous phrase, it says, do you believe what I tell you? Or do you believe what you see with your own eyes? And that's what bugged the Egyptologists. They were telling everybody, no, it's nonsense, it isn't, but they saw it with their own eyes. But there is something else, and I'm going to look at my watch. Oh, yes, good, we have half an hour. There is something else. Let's move. Oh, oh I'm stuck again. Uh, oh, no. Actually, look at this. this. I've done reconstruction. This is the area, right? Remember the Nile, the pyramids here? Here is the stars with the Milky Way, and as you superimpose them, you have a landscape. The Nile becomes the Milky Way, the stars become the, the, the pyramids. They clearly want to tell us something. And they want to tell us with a universal language. They want us to be able to read it. How incredible that they've done this, and they think it's a tomb to take photographs. Maybe in a thousand years, maybe in two thousand years, they're going to laugh at us for saying, you've missed the obvious. Maybe. I published in 89, here it is, my first article. And that's what Egyptologists were very upset. It was published in Oxford, in an Oxford journal, and I said, I'll put it in a book. It came out in 94, the Orion Mystery. I was very lucky, and I was telling uh, Dolores, I'm one of those lucky people, I don't know, I mean, it happened right for me. The book shot up to bestsellers, it was number one in England, it hit the, the scene, the BBC took it up, and... In fact, it was, you know, here is the BBC program, and I put this sketch because you have the king of the Egyptologists there, and he says, and somebody says, uh, and how would, how would Sire like to this heretic, rare, medium, or well done? That's how I felt. Uh, and there's me, I had hair in those days. And I'm saying, you can't read it here, I'm saying, look, all I did was tell you that there was an Orion correlation. <laughs> you want to burn me? It felt that way, it's very odd. It's very odd when you're going against the grain, the established view. Uh, if you do come to my lecture tomorrow, you'll see, because I'll be talking a lot about Galileo Kepler and how the Inquisition, the Roman Inquisition, tried to stop facts. I felt like in an Inquisition, it's rather odd. Any of you who may have their own ideas or found something that is unusual, go ahead. They can't burn you these days. You just take the beating, the intellectual beating. If you can take it, you'll break through. Anyway, but there was a problem. There was a little, little problem. The correlation was there, the three stars looked at the three stars, the belt of uh, the three pyramids on the ground, the offset was correct. But the angle, the angle that the stars formed, this is in 2500 BC, was too sharp. The pyramids were at 45 degrees and the stars were at about 17 degrees from the horizon, from the horizontal. That's how they looked like. And it's a bit like this painting again. You, you wanted to... Yeah? Can you do it? No? Yes? Can anybody move the stars? No. I can. You can move them if you prepare to take the leap of faith. Maybe, that's what I said to myself, maybe they've got the wrong date. Let's see if they do match what's on the ground, if you try different dates. And I've got to tell you this, because I remember this was with my co-author, Graham Hancock, and I called him up, because I was there, and I said, let's tick, 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 go back, back in time. Here is how they were in 2500 BC. You see the shallow angle? And here is how you want them to be. 
And I pressed, and I pressed, and I pressed, and I pressed. And I went to the lowest point. And that's when they matched. Hold on, hold on. Because that was a problem. According to Egyptologists, there was nobody there. <laughs> Not really. And if they thought I'd caused the polemic with saying the three stars look like three pyramids, boy, they got angry with this one, I can tell you. And I told my colleague Graham Hancock, shall we publish? Because it's there. And he said, they're going to drive us, I and mean, they're going to kill us. Robert, they're going to kill us. And I said, we're going to take this leap of faith. The Platonic argument. Plato said, follow the argument. Do not listen. Follow the evidence. There's a very famous, there's a modern saying by Robert Schock. You know who Robert Schock is? Dr. Robert Schock from Boston University, the man who dated the Sphinx. You remember in the early 90s, he made a big deal that a geologist, he examined the geology of the Sphinx and he said it's much older. And he talked to a group of Egyptologists. He thought they'd be pleased. He examined the geology and he said the Sphinx is several thousand years older. And instead of clapping, they went bananas. And one of them stood up and said, Mr. Doctor, you call yourself Dr. Shock? There isn't a single Egyptologist in this room who will agree with you. And he said, I don't follow the Egyptologists. I follow the science. And he's right. You've got to have that solidity. It, it, believe me, it's very frightening because you're going to go against the grain here. But what made me do it is something else. If you can find a lock, if you can find something else on this site with the pyramids that gives the same date. There is something else. There is the three pyramids. And there is something else, something very big there. Something really big. Oh, here is various correlations. You can see the correlation, how nice it is, by the way. This is a graphic design, three pyramids, three stars, the Milky Way. What made it interesting is that the Egyptians spoke of something called the first time. They talked about something called, they called it actually Zeptepi, it's in ancient Egyptian. The first time. The first time is when it all began, as far as they're concerned. Now, the reasoning was, if they believe that Osiris, the stellar god, the constellation of Orion, was the creator, was the man, or the god who started their civilization, then let's go to his first time, the beginning of the cycle, this wobble cycle, which I did. And the pyramids match. But there's something else. This is our symbol, by the way. There is this guy, the Sphinx. Let me go. You remember this movement of the star, of the sun? You remember that? Well, the Great Sphinx of Giza, the Great Sphinx of Giza. Now I knew that Robert Schock, this was in the early 90s, I knew that he had worked with geology, he had examined the erosion of the Sphinx, and he said the Sphinx is older, much older. And I was coming up with this idea that we're talking about 10,500 BC. Could the Sphinx somehow be dated to the same epoch? Here are the three pyramids. To show you the scale of these monuments, by the way, the Sphinx is here. It looks like a dinky toy, but it isn't. It's about two city blocks long. It's 15 meters high. It's a huge monument, but look at the scale. Here he is, or here she is. It might be a she, it might be a him, we don't know. But one thing is sure. It is straddled, it is crouching, and it is looking east. It is looking at the rising sun. And it is looking at the rising sun due east. You've seen how it, the sun, right? Due east. 
And here is the moment. I'll never forget this. I was on the phone, and I said, Graham, I wish you could see what I'm seeing here. Graham Hancock. Here it is. I'll skip a bit here, because we don't want to take much time. We wrote this book together, by the way. It's actually titled The Message of This Thing. Somebody had a copy here in America. Here she is. It's looking at the sun due east. Remember the sun at the summer solstice? Winter solstice, right? Now it's looking at the sun due east. But behind the sun, behind the sun are stars. You can't see them because of the light of the sun. The sun is in a house, we call it, or in a zodiacal constellation. You are born in certain houses, right? Here is an actual picture, very faint, I'm standing here. I usually take tours to Egypt, by the way. You might want to join me one day. They light up the Sphinx at night. It's something amazing. You go there in the dark, and then suddenly it's lit up. Anyway, here it's looking, very faint, there's a little bit of dust this day. It's looking at sunrise, the head of the Sphinx here. Can you see it faintly? Looking due east. Okay. I did this in 2008, but it's roughly what we have now. It's looking at the sunrise on the spring equinox. Constellation of Aquarius. Now, you remember, and who, is, who was my age, roughly in the 60s? You know, we used to go around and sing the, the age of Aquarius. Uh, we didn't know what it meant, but we were going, this is the new age of Aquarius. What it meant is that because of the precession of the equinoxes, we were moving into the, the sun was moving at spring equinox into Aquarius. We go to the time of Jesus, and it was in Pisces. You see much of the Christian iconography of the fish. We go to the time of the pyramids, and it's in, well, it's Aries, but Aries doesn't look like anything. The Sphinx is a lion with a human head looking east. We go to 8,000, it's in Cancer, and we go to 10,500 BC, that date. And that's what's behind it. It cannot be a coincidence. All the monuments lock to this date. In, 10, 000, in 2000, what the Egyptologists say, the constellation was there because of the wobble. But you go to 10,500 BC and it does that. And it does that not just at that date. It does that when the stars of Orion's belt are due south in alignment with the pyramids, precisely at that time. Here is the correlation. Three pyramids, three stars, Sphinx, Leo. We have a celestial simulacra on the ground. If it is a coincidence, it is a billion to one coincidence. <sighs> what do we do with it? Sorry? It's been published. <laughs> Who was there? in 10,500 BC. Egyptologists say nobody. There's this famous conference of, uh, of Robert Schock, and another Egyptologist stood up and said, OK, 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 OK. I mean, yeah, OK, yeah, makes good sense. But show us a pot child. Show us something. Show us an artifact. Show us anything that can tell us that there were people there, and people capable of doing this. And we said, well, uh, come on, it's your job, guys. <laughs> I mean, you're the Egyptologist, go and look. Go on, go on, go on, find it. Didn't bother. 
But we found it. We found it. And it was found, strangely enough, by a group of Americans. In 19, it was actually found in 19, let me get this right, in 1974, while all this was going on. Mm. You want to know? <laughs> or do you want to come to my workshop? <laughs> place here, we're way south. We're about a thousand kilometers away from the pyramids. A hundred kilometers in westwards into the Sahara. Now the Sahara is loaded with prehistoric artifacts. There's rock arts and there's bits. And, but we knew that. We knew that. And there's a group of American anthropologists, Fred Wendorf, from the, uh, from the University of Texas, actually, with a group of his students. And they're driving a car, a four-wheel drive, and they're returning to Abu Simbel, Abu Simbel, where there is a famous temple of Ramses II. And they stop to have what they call a comfort break. <laughs> oh, come on, they, they stop to have a pee, OK? I mean, uh, <laughs> And while they're having their comfort break there, somebody says, hey, hold on a minute. There's some strange stones here, and they're looking around. Anyway, to cut a long story short, they discovered Napta Playa. Napta Playa is one of those things. They discovered, we found out later, it took a while to work it out, the oldest ceremonial astronomical site in the world. stone circles, and stone alignments, and directions, and strange rocks buried under. Very weird site. I just had to go. I just had to go. Fame. This was published, by the way, in 97. It took them a while. It's one of those strange things. They were anthropologists. They were looking for signs and artifacts. They didn't bother to check the alignments. And they brought an astronomer, a fellow called Kim Melville, from Boulder, Colorado, who was studying medicine wheels and all these strange uh, Indian American astronomical artifacts. And he said, but this is an astronomical circle. And he worked out that it had an alignment to the summer solstice. And the three stones in the middle were aligned to the rising of Orion's belt. And he found, let's see if I've got them here. He found, here is a, a graphic of the Napta Playa settings, Orion's belt, and alignments to the star Sirius. And better still, they didn't just align to the stars, they tracked them. They were following precession. And the site dates, are you ready for this, to about 10,000 BC. Who was there? Who did this? We began to call them the star people. Couldn't find them. No signs, nothing. Just the stones, like the pyramids. Where are they? Here is a reconstruction, by the way. It was an ancient alien. Did you see this problem? It's called the Orion Connection, or the Orion something. I did it with Tom Brophy, the astrophysicist. Google it. <laughs> Here we are at Napta Playa, observing the summer solstice sunrise. Star, oh, sorry, sun clocks, dials. 12 stones with a lifting stone. Here is the gang. We did this in uh, 2008. You, it takes you five days to travel from the Nile 
to the place, not Napta Playa, Napta Playa is only 100 kilometers. We went to look for these people. And we found them. Or well, we found the remains. They actually left us pictures of them. There's Tom Brophy, my colleague. He's an astrophysicist at uh, San Diego. And we reach a zone. Let me go to the map quickly, let's get a feel of it. We traveled from about here to here. It's 700 kilometers. It takes you five days in the open desert. Of course, we use GPS and all this. It's like going to the moon. And you arrive at the most bizarre, uninhabited area. It's a mountain area called Gilf Kibir. Two mountain areas. Gilf Kibir is the size of Switzerland. If you can imagine Switzerland without any trees. It was discovered, amazingly, only in 1923. We didn't know it was there. You can read about it, by the way. I think I have one of my books about this, Black Genesis, it's called. And another area called Jebel Uweinat, I tell you, it's so mysterious. It's one of those weird things. You really feel like you arrived on planet Mars. It looks like planet Mars. It's in red soil and strange stone structures. And, and let me go fast here. Yeah. Oops, I'm stuck again. <laughs> anyway, the picture you're seeing here, we actually made it. It took us five days. You don't wash for 12 days, by the way. It's one of those things. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We slept about 10 yards apart each other. <laughs> yeah, you know, you wear the same T-shirt for 12 days, and it begins to be solid. Well, we have to do this because there's a limited amount of water you can take. What's important is to take enough fuel to come back. There's nothing. No shops, no nothing. <laughs> We're just there. It's like going to Mars. Uh, okay. We're approaching the area. This is way not. It's a very eerie feeling. You're about to enter a totally unexplored, totally uninhabited place. It's a very strange feeling. I was trying to describe it to some people at lunch. I felt like I was making contact with lost people because they're there, or they left us as Mark. Uh, I don't know why it's not working. Let me try the... Maybe I've been staying too long here. What, what you'll be seeing in the next picture, if you can get it... Yep. Okay, stick around there. Okay, no, go one back. Yeah, thanks. Very faintly, you see this? It's hieroglyphs. The very first evidence that the pharaohs went there. Until 2007, the Egyptologist argued that it was impossible to go there. You can't carry enough water to reach that place. We can do it now, of course, with four-wheel drives. But in those days, it was impossible. And yet they did it. It's the name of a pharaoh called Mentuhotep II. Here is his famous name in the cartouche. We call this a cartouche. He's sitting on a throne there, but it's too faint for you to see. And he's receiving emissaries. He's receiving guests. He's a pyramid builder, by the way. Mentuhotep was the pyramid age. The pyramid builders went there. And we now know, because we interpret texts, that they went to see their ancestors. It's like some of you may go to Ireland or some of you may go to China to find out where you came from. We found them. Whoops. Oh, dear. They were black African people. Very weird. Very weird. We haven't seen anything like it. There's a drawing that's really puzzling. They had domesticated cattle. Now, when the area was discovered, here is some of their descendants. In 1923. When they went two years later, they had gone. Gone. We don't know where they are. There's probably one of them. Uh, not me, the other one. Right? 
It's a very, very early stages. But we think we found the source. And these people, are you ready for this? Said they came from the stars. Thank you very much. Uh, we might have five minutes if you have questions. Can I take a, a five minutes? Yeah, five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Dolores, five minutes. Anybody has a question? Okay, go ahead. Oh, you're going to use it? Okay. Um, can you tell us about the erosion that they discovered and how they figured that out, that it was water erosion on the Sphinx? On the Sphinx, yes. Uh, okay, I won't bother with the picture, but um, here's the thing. Uh, it started with uh, John West, an American. He's now about 74 years old. A, you, if you get a chance to go to a talk of John West, don't miss it. He actually conducts tours in Egypt, we sometimes do together. He's an amazing man. And like me, he's the first one who looked at something that for some reason the Egyptologists didn't bother to look at. He noticed that there were vertical erosions on the Sphinx and on the Sphinx enclosure on the wall that surrounds the Sphinx. The Sphinx isn't actually built. It's actually carved from the living rock. And what they did is they cut into the, um, the rock, uh, cleared the, the, the rocky area, and left a knoll in the middle, which became, became the Sphinx. Now, the wall of this enclosure had vertical erosion. And for some reason, Egyptologists didn't query it. And they thought, wait a minute, it's the only place there, in this area, that has vertical erosion. And what causes vertical erosion must be running water. Now, if there was running water at the time that the Egyptologists say, we should find vertical erosions everywhere, right? It couldn't have just rained on the Sphinx and nowhere else. And so he brought it up, and of course they shooed him away, and they, they thought, said he was a madman, the usual thing. Until he was very lucky, and he met Robert Schock from Boston University, and he told him this, and Robert Schock said, okay, I'll go and investigate. And Robert Schock, this was 1991, and they went there, and Schock immediately said, this is water erosion. But where's the rain? <laughs> you know, because they studied cl climatic charts, and there was no rain. Well, there was, certainly, if there was water erosion from dripping rain, then you'd expect to find it everywhere. Okay. It's only there. Therefore, it must be of a different age. What age? He examined the rock, he examined the, the depth of the erosion, and he said, OK, well, it's at least, and he was being very conservative, it's at least three or 4,000 years before the pyramid builders. And that's when I told you the story. He went to present this at the Geological Convention in San Diego, and they went bananas. <laughs> but it's a very, very, and that, of course, what created the, the polemic even further is we had two hard sciences. We have astronomy, you've seen it, and we have geology. They're very hard sciences that argues that these monuments predate the period that Egyptologists say. The science is saying it. And this is the annoying thing, is that we have the church of Egyptology. They won't follow the science. They'd rather follow their own ideas. And we've been arguing this for 30 years. But that's how they found it. And of course, it's all published. If you want to read about it in detail, uh, there's a couple of books by Robert Schock. It's called The Voyage of the Pyramid Builders and a few others. I'm going with, sorry, yeah? So was the water there at 10,500? Yes. We know because the climate of the Sahara was much wetter around that period. In fact, that's how the people of Napta Playa survived. They survived because there was water in the Sahara. The Sahara was fertile. You've seen the animals. I, I couldn't show you too many pictures, but they have animals like giraffes and tigers and elephants, which could only survive with water, whereas now nothing lives there. So there's the, everything points to their much older age. There is no doubt about it. The big question is, who? And they keep insisting, this is the weird thing, I mean, I don't want to get into the woo-woo stuff, but they keep insisting that somehow the knowledge came from the stars. That's all I can tell you. Now, who, what, where, I don't know. 
Another one? Uh, yes. We have two minutes, Dolores. Is there a temple at the site of Sirius, the star Sirius, that dates back to 10,500? Good question. And I also wondered, is Napta Playa in Libya or Egypt? Egypt. Egypt, okay. Napta Playa is um, uh, 100 kilometers west of Abu Simbel and 50 kilometers from the Sudanese border. It's within Egypt. Uh, so is the, the mountain areas, by the way. Uh, parts of it go into Libya. It straddles. Uh, your first question was, uh, is there a... Well, that's the problem. Um, since we brought out these theories, it, now there's a few other discoveries, and I do hope you'll come to the, to the workshop, because... <laughs> no, no, there is, there is a famous... Who's clapping there? <laughs> There is the famous doors, which we haven't discussed, and I'd really like to bring you update to this. Uh, as you probably remember, I hope, in 93, a German uh, robotic engineer, Rudolf Canterbrick, I was very much involved with him at the time, discovered a door, a little trap door, at the end of the shaft pointing to the star Sirius. It hasn't been opened yet. Uh, National Geographic tried in 2002, they drilled the hole, if you remember, but what they found was another door, about 50 centimeters away. And in the northern shaft, there is a northern shaft, they found another door. I'll, I'll update you on this, because we, uh, the, the odds are of something very odd here. These shafts are something else. We, we just don't get it. But we're suspecting now there's, there's definitely something behind these doors. And we're suspecting the most, well, anything. And now, because of what the Germans, who went there last year, uh, we're, we're, we're meeting in Italy, by the way, a fellow called Dominic Gorlitz. You should have him here, by the way, Dolores. He uh, is quite an extraordinary guy. Uh, he, the, 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 the Egyptians ha have put a criminal court case against him. They want him in jail. They want him in jail because he entered the pyramid with permission. He had a permit, and he scraped off two milligrams from the ceiling of the king's chamber, made of granite. That's all it is. He took it back in Germany, and they had it analyzed by the Dresden University Laboratories. And I'll be able to tell you a bit about this if you come to the... And this ties up... Yeah, yeah, I'll stop in a minute. Okay, thank you very much. You're exhausted, I'm exhausted. Thank you. What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS.